So um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our sixth webinar in our Seabird Census webinar series, helping you to get ready for our Seabird Census in 2023. Um, this webinar is Adventures in Data Land, how to handle Seabird survey data. So we'll be talking about data collection, management, and storage, and how to avoid those um, data disasters. So thanks so much for joining. We want this to be a really interactive session. So after uh, we go through the presentations, then we will have um, some interactive um, activities for you guys to do where you're actually gonna be counting some seabirds and entering data. We'll have questions and answers and so forth. So it'll be a really exciting session. So our first presenter today is Yvonne Satke. He is a research associate at Clemson University. He studies seabirds in the Western North Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean. He is a core member of the International Black Cat Petrel Conservation Group and a co-chair of our Seabird Working Group. So welcome, Yvonne, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. Um, just to make sure you don't see the, the thumbnails of people, right, on the screen. You just see my slideshow. You don't see the video feed. No, okay. no, it's fine. We see okay. we see slideshow. People can choose what they want to see on their screen. All right, great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone. <clears throat> Sorry. Thanks everyone for for being here. Um, before we start, um, so this series of webinar, which is more about training, uh, this is the sixth one. That's going to end with this one, but we're going to keep having a few more. Web we'll call them webinar, but they're they're more about discussions. And we'll call them species hours, um, where we're going to discuss ways of surveying, uh, censusing seabirds based on species and habitat. So the next one will be on big seabird and nest on bushes or on mm -hmm. um, or shrubs. So there'll be pelican, frigate bird, boobies, and cormorants. And the idea with that is to have a organized discussion uh, where people can share their their knowledge on of sur surveying this type of species, and then those who don't know but want to survey them can ask questions as well. So it will be more of a discussion than a, than a webinar uh, with slides. So the next one is in uh, January 26. At this time, we'll have another one in February on on uh, cavity nesters, and then another one in March on terns and and bird nest in, in big colonies on the ground. Uh, today, so we're talking about data. We're going to discuss uh, collecting data, the type of data sheet, uh, sorry, the challenges and consider considerations of collecting data and being in the field, um, as well as type of data sheets, type of data we're going to be recording, uh, databases, and data sharing as well as data use. So this uh, first coordinated Caribbean census, seabird census um, that we're planning for this year, 2023. Um, well, I just started some, some folks have been doing uh, surveys already in uh, Turks and Caicos. I think some of the people have been serving uh, pelicans because they're nesting over the end and beginning of the year. Um, so it's here, uh, seabird surveys have started. The, the aim of this data collection that we, are all going to do this year and maybe next year as well if it keeps going, um, is to collect comparable data. That's really the, the idea of this um, survey throughout the region at once. Using standardized, standardized units, we're going to go over that a bit later. The idea is to have a, a wide data coverage for the whole region uh, with the largest number of colonies as possible. And that's really to update the knowledge we have of the seabirds on the region as a whole, because the the, la the latest um, snapshot is from 2009, which is uh, getting old now. Uh, that, those data would provide, um, would be able to update species status, update management at the national level, at the island level, but also at the regional level, um, and as well as improving skills for, for monitoring seabirds throughout the region. Um, so this is the map from the 2009 data set, um, there are a lot of colonies in the Caribbean. Um, there are about 800 islands that have seabirds on them. So we don't expect that all of them will be covered and surveyed this year. 
of course. Uh, but we're really trying to push for as much as possible, as much as you can do this year. Um, if you can go out, that would be great. If you if if you cannot, but you know you could go out another year, you know there's an island there you would like to go. Um, it's always also very good to know that so we can prioritize work for the the night the, the years coming in. So of course, as we go out, there are challenges to go to the field. And I, I wanted to keep this slide first because I put it in the bottom, but it's very important to realize that, well, everybody knows that your safety is always more important than the data you can collect. And people say, oh, working in the tropics, it's easy, you just work on the beach in the sun. Well, maybe, but there are a lot of risks um, and challenges linked to that. If you're going to use boats, there are always issues with boats and you can run aground, there can be storms. Um, heat is a big issue too. It's great to be in the sun, but it can be very dangerous. There's storms coming in very quickly, uh, going over an, over an even terrain. So it's easy to damage your legs or feet, break a leg or to when you surface near cliffs to fall off cliffs, cliffs. And this is true for seabird professionals everywhere. We all have been in dangerous situations, or we know people who have been in dangerous situations. Uh, and now we are repeated, your safety is always the most important. Um, data can be collected another another day, and if it cannot, then it cannot. But you should be safe um, and make sure the people working with you are safe and make sure that if your boss tells you to go, uh, you can tell them, well, I, I don't feel safe going. This being said, so there's still, I guess, smaller challenges which are linked to weather conditions like if you're doing doing surveys on a boat or using a boat uh, rough seas swells rain and storm can come and go extreme temperatures of course heat but also cold when when it start uh, you, you caught in a storm high wind um, difficult habitat conditions that could be rough or dangerous terrain um, working in a seabird colony means dirt and, and guano which can sound trivial, but it's um, it can be an issue. Um, as well as in some colony, in some island, it could be either thorny vegetation like cactuses or poisonous vegetation as well. And for people who have um, some ear issues, uh, the night the noise level can be very very uh, high in in some turn colonies or laughing go colonies as well. Uh, to add to that, of course, equipment is going to always going to break. Um, pants are going to leak and break. Uh, notebooks can get, can get waterlogged. Optics, binoculars are going to fall and, and hit a rock. And GPS are going to run out of batteries. That's always the case. So there's, these are some solutions. They're, they're not a solution for everything. But um, what I would say is always to prepare to have an emergency plan, especially if you're going offshore or going to an area that's um, out of the way. Um, always make sure there is somebody who knows where you're going and, and at least two people are going together. Um, if you're going to be seasick or if you, if you know you're going to be seasick or some people might be, it, it happens. Um, I, I've been seasick and um, it's very annoying because you cannot do any work. Uh, well, bring some medication that, that helps a lot. Um, protective clothing for heat or rain helps and if you can bring Portable water and cool packs, that's also very good. Um, protective fo footwear, um, <clears throat> it's not mount mountainous environment, but it's really, it's not in mountains, but th the rocky shorelines are very much like mountains. So although it's hard to find good mountain wear or like footwear, uh, if you can find good shoes, like strong shoes with a strong sole and protecting your ankle, that, that's the best for doing seabird work um, in, in rocky rocky environment. Always have a first aid kit. Um, be prepared for any emergency, especially if you're going offshore. And in places where plants can be thorny, dangerous, uh, poisonous, know your plants as well. For equipment, there are <clears throat> solutions as well. Um, there's waterproof notepads that exist, waterproof, um, sorry, uh, notebooks. Oops. Uh, always bring batteries, spare batteries and backup equipment if you have them and really pencil, like pens are not great because they, they leak, they break. Pencil, the, like the wooden pencil that you can sharpen with a knife, that's actually the best uh, thing. So these were for the 
the smart ch ch uh, challenges. In terms of consider consideration, bef before we jump into more the data sheet and the data collecting, um, there are two uh, pieces of advice. The first one is you went somewhere, uh, you check into that nest what, that you thought maybe a shale water nest and you saw nothing. Well, that's already something. Um, zero data, it, I'm just reading what's there. But zero data is still data, so make sure you record it. Um, and when you record it, if it's um, a zero, like you did not see something, put a zero. If you're not sure, <clears throat> for example, there could be a check at the bottom of that, that burrow, um, do not mark it as zero, but mark it as a, a dash in your data sheet or a NA for, um, or any word that you know is, doesn't mean zero, but I could not survey. Um, <clears throat> if you can, it's not always possible. It depends on, on a lot of things, but visiting colony multiple times a year is highly recommended, but of course it's not very likely that you could, but some species have multiple peaks, variable timings in their breeding. So it's uh, the best is to be able to go a few times a year. But anyway, <clears throat> whether you go once or whether you go five times, always keep records of what, you, what you're seeing and what, what you're um, doing. So on this, <clears throat> after this little intro introduction, I'll uh, let Rayanan share her screen. Okay, are you still there, Rayanan? Sorry, hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay, let's see what happens when I do this. <clears throat> dun, dun, dun. Ba, ba, ba. Can you see yep. the screen? Okay, hi everyone. I'm Rhiannon. Um, I am another one of the co-chairs of the working group and I'm talking to you from the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, I am tasked with running through data recording and the importance of knowing what your recording units are, um, thinking about what you're going to collect, why you want to collect it, and what suitable um, transferable recording units might be. So what to consider when you're setting up your data sheets um, so that we can gain information that is transferable from island to island and country to country. Um, and that if we're lucky enough to receive some data from you in an ele electronic format, um, so that we can then look at what's happening across the whole Caribbean with our SIBO populations, then we're able to interpret your information and it's generalizable um, for everybody to understand. So I'm just gonna run through some example data sheets um and just the kind of fields that we would be keen to have fed through to us as a working group when we're trying to link all of the different information together um so it's obviously going to be hugely dependent on the species that you're working on in the site conditions some of the constraints that your team might have in terms of logistics time um finances to do your survey so it's hugely dependent um, the, the units you can collect, the type of data sheets you're going to use. But we're going to go through some of the generalized, uh, generalizable fields that are pretty much standard across sites and, and places. So, um, and just to give you a brief list of what I'm going to talk through slide by slide. So we're going to talk about location, date and time, um, the people that are involved in your surveys, really importantly, the species that you're surveying. Um, it might seem like a, a really silly thing to say, but I've seen data sheets where people haven't written down the species of seabirds that they've been recording the data from in the past, um, which is fine if you know the people, but when you're coming back to it 10 years later, it can cause issues. Um, some more detailed information sometimes is possible to collect on, on specific species and their behavior. Your count unit, which is probably one of the most important things, and then some of the background information about the types of ways you collected your estimate and your counts. So we'll start with location. Um, this is really, really important to get as much detail as possible down on your data sheet just to make it transferable. Because um, in 20 years time, someone might want to repeat your survey. They need to know where you went, what area you covered. Um, so starting with fields like the country you're in, the island, um, the area, if it's an area within an island, you can break it down. Um, and then what we want, ideally, is some kind of site or colony name that's unique to the colony that you're working in. 
Um, and you can either write down a full name that's known or you can write down a code. Um, but just to say straight up, I'm going to talk about codes throughout. Anytime you use a code, it's really, really important to also provide or write down or have available some kind of key to your codes so that people that aren't involved in your survey actually can understand what your codes mean. So keep that in mind and make sure you log everything down. Um, in an ideal world, it would also be great to have some geographical information. So if you're lucky enough to have a handheld GPS unit or a mobile phone that can record your latitude and your longitude, that's brilliant. Um, as we probably all know, this can have this can be recorded in different types of um, formats. So what we're encouraging people to do as kind of a recommended is to use international standards for your recording units. So for latitude and longitude, this would be decimal degrees. Um, and what we're going to do, which I'll show you later, is to provide a cheat sheet. And um, so we're going to provide you some guidance documents, um, if you want them, that will go through all of the fields and suggestions for our preferred format or the best way to do them to make them transferable and standardised across different um, across different surveys. Uh, in the field, sometimes there's not time to write down your latitude and your longitude. And so quite often you can just take what we do here in the Turks and Caicos Islands is we have GPS units. We take a waypoint and so we take a location and we give it a unique waypoint ID number that we write into our notebook or onto our data sheet. And then we can, when we get home at the end of the day, we can download the data and all of the codes will match up and we can pull out our latitude and longitude information in our electronic um, database. Area size can also be really, really useful. So if you have a colony that you're you're serving, you might want to take a number of different locations that map the boundaries of your whole colony so that in future years, people can see the exact survey area you, you went to. And then later on, you can calculate the area size in mapping software at home if you have that available to you. And then very, very often it's useful to have a, a to draw a little site map. So I always draw a site map as an example of one of my awful drawings there on, on the screen. I try to put as much information in, in that as possible about the area that we're surveying. So I might show where we landed if we went on a boat, um, if we're using a drone, where the drone takeoff sites were, where north is, what kind of habitat is, where the birds were, all that kind of information. Um, just as much information as possible is really, really useful. And having your mind, if you've got past surveys that have happened at your site, try and be consistent in terms of using information that they used in the past so that it's, it is transferable um, between your different survey years. Um, why am I not able to, so there we go. Okay, so next is information on the date and the time, which is really, really important. We wanna know when you went on survey. Um, it might seem really simple, but be aware that even date has different conventions depending on where you are in the globe. So in the UK, we would start with day and then month and year. I know in the US, you will use month and then day and then year. So again, what we're suggesting in an ideal world is to use an international standard, which is start with the year. So for a numeric, for numerics, year, 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 month, month, day, day. Um, it doesn't really matter what you choose to do in your notebooks or on your data sheets, as long as you use the standardized method when you're inputting everything into an electronic version, if you're gonna send it to us, because um, we just really need to know exactly what convention you've used. Um, and so international standards, we would be really happy with and would save a lot of time. And, and then less chance for error. Um, start and to end time as well of your, of your survey is really important. So that might include when you arrive at the site and when you leave, but also later on when we talk about your counts, you might want to record the count times as well. And I'll explain why in a, in a bit. Um, and again, this can vary. We've got 12, a 12 hour clock, a 24 hour clock. And so the international standards would be a 24 hour clock with hour, hour and minute, minute. Um, if you're going to use 12 hour, it can get confusing because you need to make sure you write down PM or AM. So just be aware of that. And then lastly, the visit number. Um, if you're going to go to the site a number of times, it's cool to write down the, number, the, the visit number so you can then sequentially know where we're at. And it's all logged down in the um, in the data base. OK, on to species. Really, really important. Um, I'm having some formatting issues. Can everyone, is is it, uh, Yvonne, is it online, un, un, misaligned for you as well? Yes, it is. <clears throat> okay, so you okay, can still understand. There's different ways to do it. Some people write down the common name, some people write down the actual species name with the genus and the species. 
Obviously, a common name is going to vary depending, again, what language you're speaking and where you are in the globe. The species name is universal. So this is our preferred method of recording. And that's what we would ask you to report in the electronic sheets. Or you can use some kind of code because it's much, much quicker. So you could choose what you do there, but we do recommend using the species name or some kind of code that has a key that relates to a species name, whichever is quicker for you in the field. Um, it's all misaligned, but we had some examples there with the sooty tern and the white-tailed tropic bird with those three different types of species recording. But you can look at it later in the um, in the final version of the PowerPoint when we put it up on the internet. Um, but again, codes are only helpful if a key is provided with them or if we all use the same codes regionally. And we will give you some example codes that we are, we are going to um adopt or recommend in a cheat sheet if you wanted to use those or you can make up your own if you're unsure of the species id obviously just take photos if you've got a camera um so that you can check it, them out with other people in the community and record the method and any any identifying features you use to try and determine the species identification and obviously as we all know there's loads of really good bird id books out there i always have one with me regardless because sometimes something might crop up and i just don't know what it is so it's always good to have it on standby Okay, so count units, um, probably the most important. And this is, again, going to vary hugely on what type of survey you're doing and how much information you can get and what species you're working on. So as a minimum and as a very high level unit, um, we would be keen to have total number of individuals. So this is probably the easiest thing to collect in terms of your counts. And that's counting every bird that you see. Um, so if you've got, if, if it's a flush count or your birds are flying overhead, you can just do, get an estimate of count and number of birds that you can see in front of you. Um, but we know that adults and juveniles obviously have different behaviours and different levels of vulnerability. And what we're interested in from a conservation standpoint, in terms of population estimates, is the breeding faction of your seabird population. So what we really want to know is the number of breeding pairs or the number of nests. Um, a unit which is often used and which we're adopting is apparently occupied nests or AONs. Um, and this can be an, a, a nest with an active individual in it or a nest which has shown recent activity with eggs or chicks. Um, and as a sort of base, the number of nests would be great or the number of adults on nests. But in some cases, you may be able to get to collect more information. So you might be able to actually tell us something about the nest contents. Um, and we're gonna provide a number of sheets and again, a number of different codes and, and categories that you can use here if you want to use them. Um, and I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, you may be lucky enough to be working with a species that you can tell the, the males and females are part of adults. Not all seabirds you can. I work on magnificent frigate birds a lot and they're brilliant because the males are different to the females when they're adults, which is really easy. So then if you can break down your higher level counts by sex or by the life stage or the age of the birds. So we, we would like in an ideal world, if you can get it, adults and, um, and juveniles, so birds that aren't actually breeding adults, that really does help as well. So we'll go over that in more detail. Uh, and then the count method. So if you can record what type of platform you're counting from, whether you're on foot, whether you're in an aeroplane and counting from above, um, whether you're counting from a boat-based platform, or um, there's various different ways you could be counting your birds. So please record the recording platform if you can. Um, and then the type of method you're using. So as we've talked about in past webinars, there's lots of different types of surveys you can undertake. You might be able to take a full, full count in, and, and, and cover all of the ground in your colony. Um, you may only be able to sample a small section of it and have to extrapolate up to the full colony using other methods when you get home. So you might be doing a transect or you might be counting within a smaller number of plots. Um, you may have to do a flush count or it may just happen that the birds flush and you count them all in the air. So we want to know what method you use to gain your count and then whether it was full. So whether you counted everything, the whole colony or whether it was a partial count, which kind of relates to your survey method. But it's another field that, that would be great to have. And then lastly, um, probably in many cases, you'll be giving us uncorrected counts, but sometimes people are able to apply correction factors to their counts to account for various different things that affect the counts. Um, so if you're going to make any corrections to your raw data, then we'd ask that you'd also write down some information about that with the details of the corrections that you made so that we can look at the raw data and, and the corrected and understand what the figures relate to. 
Um, and then lastly, we have data quality. So sometimes it's really easy and you have high confidence in what you're seeing because you might be looking at a ground nesting bird where the, there's high visibility. Other times you're working in dense vegetation or the bird behavior just makes it really difficult to get a really highly accurate estimate. So if you're able to use some kind of scale to measure the confidence you have in your estimate and in your data, then that can be really, really helpful. Um, we're suggesting a very simple scale of low, moderate and high confidence. And we'll give definitions for those three things, um, but you can create your own as long as it's described and we really understand you know, why you may be feeling confident or unconfident about your estimate. That just helps. Um, and there's nothing wrong with not being confident in your estimate or not being able to count everything. We know habitats can be really extreme. Um, an example of a prickly pear field in which this I presented in another webinar with all the sooty terms nesting in amongst it, really hard to count them. Um, sometimes weather comes in and it's a nightmare. The birds may all flush and fly away from the area. It's very difficult. But what this does is it provides more valuable information on which sites you may want to focus your survey efforts on next time in the following season or following visit. And if there might be alternative survey methods that might be more suited to your environment and your species. So I'm just going to quickly run through some example sheets. This first one is, um, and these are data sheets that are being used by you amongst the community. Thank you, everyone that provided them to us. We've had lots sent in to us. Um, this first one is from the current Birds Caribbean Seabird Monitoring Manual. So it's the one that's in there at the moment. We're trying to revamp this for the census, um, but it's a really simple example of a form that has a nice box at the top with all of the general information you wanna collect on weather, on date, on surveyors, on location. And then a really nice simple table, which just runs through species, number of adults, number of nests, and some information about chicks. And you can see at the bottom, it's got a nice key so that you know what your fields are for input. Um, the next one I'm gonna show is a, the boat-based data sheets that EPIC use for their citizen science scientists when they go out to collect data from boats on seabirds. It's a really nice form, as you can see, with some beautiful color, color images of the different species. And what they do is they take out laminated sheets on the boats. They've got nice um, platforms in which they can record data. Their observers use dry eraser pens to um, mark the number and do their counts on the sheet. Then they take a picture of the data sheet immediately and they send it to Epic via WhatsApp. So almost immediately they have an electronic backup copy of the data and it's stored electronically, which is really, really cool. I'm just apologizing as well for the formatting here. I'm not sure what's happened. I know everything's a little bit off, but that's just an, a zoomed in example of the sheet that um, the Epic use. So it's, they've got some really cool little, little images there, which makes it a bit more fun. Um, and then we've got another sheet from the Anguilla National Trust for their seabird surveys on some of their offshore keys. And this is for the sooty tern. So again, it's a really nice, simple sheet that has all of the information at the top on the survey site and the conditions. And I really like this one because they've basically listed all the different categories for their different weather variables that you can just circle. So it's really easy. You've got everything there already. You don't have to write it out. You don't have to have a separate key. You can just circle the different fields. And then again, a lovely simple table with the number of adults, adults on nests, chicks, eggs, and any other observations that you want to write in a data box at the bottom. As I'm sure many of you are aware, it's not always as easy as that. Um, paper forms are not always suitable depending on your field conditions. And um, it's just a nightmare carrying a clipboard sometimes. So in some conditions, you do have to use notebooks, um, little pocket notebooks. And Yvonne's already uh, mentioned these brilliant right in the rain, all weather, waterproof notebooks that they have now. Um, and this is fine. It's absolutely fine. You can then transcribe them later. We use them a lot in certain and Caicos Islands because we're jumping from boats and swimming with all our kit in dry bags above us, above our heads to a key. And then we get off soaking wet and we just start surveying. So we can't, we can't take A4 sheets and clipboards. Um, but what we do is we take photos when we're finished to back up the data again. So it's electronic and we store it on, on, a, um, on, on the internet so that it's all backed up for us. And again, you can tape your codes into your notebooks and you can carry your printed out forms that are beautiful that you can have beside you. So you've got all your keys uh, with you ready to go. <clears throat> and this is an example of one of our um, one of our forms that we use out here. It's a subsampling form for some um, plots that we do when we can't cover the whole colony. 
Uh, this is the beautiful form that you get in your Excel spreadsheet on the left. On the right is what it actually looks like once we've gone into the field and we've collected the data. Um, so that's real life stuff. As you know, it's not always pitch perfect forms. Um, and then you get to the more complex level of forms, which are when you're lucky enough to work in a colony where you can go back a number of times a year and you can monitor individual nests. So you can get information on individual nests. Um, you can have much more complex forms that tell you something about your repeat visits and what's happened with that particular pair and their nesting attempt. And we've got an example here from um, the University of Puerto Rico for the lease turn work that Luis is doing out there. And on the right, we've got one of the example forms from the Cayman Islands Government Department of Environment for their brown booby population surveys that they do. But this does require high levels of resources, obviously, and staff. Um, so it's not always applicable or possible at all sites. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to provide you with a bunch of example standardized data sheets. Um, we're going to put them up on a link on our Seabird Working Group web pages, and these can be downloaded and they can be adapted if you want to use them. We know that some of you are already OK with this and you're going to have your own forms and you're going to want to create your own forms. But if you want to have a look at what we've got up there, you can download them, you can adapt them for your specific sites and conditions. And we'll give you forms for full population counts, for different subsampling methods, for high level individual nest um, survey efforts. Um, and it will all hopefully be there if you want to download it as some, some guidance. Again, we're going to provide you with, so this is an example of some of the sheets we're working on now. Um, we'll send them out, we'll put the link up, and then you can try them and use them if you want. And we'd recommend, um, sorry, we'd, we'd appreciate any feedback. So if you want to use them, please try it out, come back to us, tell us they're great or they're rubbish, or we just honest feedback is great because then we can improve them. So this is our main data sheet that we're working on at the moment. We're going to give you an, a, a run through in a minute. Um, these are specific different tables for different types of surveys. So we've got on the, on the right here, flash counts. Um, at the bottom, time restricted peak aerial counts, which are really useful for species like white-tailed tropic birds and just tropic birds that are very difficult to, act. sometimes it's difficult to act at that access their nest sites. Um, and then we've got some of the subplots and the transec um, sheets as well. So a bunch of information that will be available if you want it. And we're working on a cheat sheet, which will look much more visually pleasing than what you see in front of you right now. But we're going to give you all of the, um, the different parameters that in an ideal world, it would be great to count, uh, sorry, to record uh, with some descriptions of the different what the different counts relate to, some preferred formats that we would like if you are happy to participate and provide us with your data once they're collected for the regional um, regional uh, efforts and some examples of the kind of fields of what the fields would look like when you write them down. Okay, um, so I think I'm gonna pass over to Yvonne now because we're gonna have a little, do a little exercise um, where we fill out a spreadsheet just to show you an uh, example with counting birds from an image. Just stop scratch. Uh, All right, thanks, Rick. <clears throat> so yeah, we're going to um, try to do as much as we can of a live exercise. So we're going to share, sorry, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and hopefully you can see the data sheet on the left and on the right, you should be able to see a picture um, of a pelican colony part of it. So we just um, imagine we just landed on, on, the, on this island, or maybe we didn't land, we just took our car and drove to this part of the island um, or walked. Um, but what we're going to do in, in this case, it's um, a plot. <clears throat> so we, we came yesterday and we, we set up the plot around that part of the colony. It's a, it's a bigger colony, but it's almost all like this. So we're just going to subsample it. Um, so we came yesterday, uh, we, 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 we know what we're looking at, and we're coming back today once the birds are settled down. So on the left, I have the, the data sheet that uh, Rhiannon just showed. I already filled it out with information on, well, today's date, um, the country, the island, arrival time on when we came to the site, the site name and code. The platform is how you record, how you they're doing your survey, so we're on foot in the ground. Um, then <clears throat> I guess the part time we, we have should do that at the end, but we put it so we wouldn't forget it. 
the latitude and longitude of the location. And if you're using different GPS units or using a waypoint, um, sometimes on some apps, you can just click on, on the waypoint and the app will take the GPS point itself. Uh, you can put it, write it down as well. Um, count ID, if, if you're coming back several times or you're doing several counts within the same island, that can help you, that's for, that's for you. Um, in terms of people here, so there is <clears throat> Rhiannon, who is going to be the observer. Um, I'll be the recorder. And then you all, you all the WP, the webinar um, participants. And we'll say your trainees, you're here for training and feel free to, to you know, unmute and talk to us. Um, so with our condition, it's, uh, we put some temperature. It, this is not the most important things. Uh, we put them there. It's good to have them, but it's not primordial. So temperature, cloud cover, we don't have anything to measure wind speed with us. So we just put NA, which is um, not available. The wind direction, northwest, and the sea state, um, it's two um, based on, on the buffered scale. So in this case, the survey method, uh, we're going to do a subsample, just looking at one part of the colony. And it's actually a plot. Um, a subsample could be different types. And in this case, it's a plot. And the survey, <clears throat> sorry, the survey coverage, because it's a sub, sorry, because it is a subsample, it's going to be partial. All right, so um, I drew a little map of, of this island. Um, just to remember where we were. That's always helpful in, in the evening when you come back and enter the data. And because this colony has different types of habitat and we're going to extrapolate the data uh, through this subsample, we want to put information on the habitat type. So in this case, we, we have three types of habitats. So Ryan, you're the observer. Can you tell me what, what we have? I'm just laughing because as soon as we started this, um, about three mosquitoes started flying around my head and it's like I'm actually in the field. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so so if I'm looking at the plot, which is my field of view through my binoculars, which you can see as well, um, I am I can see sea grape and I'm estimating as about 40 percent of the plot is sea grape. Okay. Um, so um, I'm taking photos as well because there's other species, sorry, species of well plants. I can't ID because I'm awful at that. Um, about 20 percent is rocks. So. Cool. Yeah, and then there is another, definitely another type of vegetation, which may be some kind of mangrove, but I can't ID it. So I'm going to take another photo and I'm going to call it, yeah, I'm unidentified and we'll go to the um, Turks and Caicos flora expert who will be able to tell me what that is when I Great. get home. Okay, so we have the information, we should put the start time, so it's for... 42 in our time zone, um, in my time zone. Um, so let's go to, to the actual count. So what species do we have there? Um, so it's brown pelican. So the code I'm going to use is BRPE. Okay. Um, and I am counting. So I've got one, two, three, four, five adults, mm -hmm. um, but it looks like two of them might be from the same nest. So this is a nest, I believe. This is a nest and that the birds are behaving as if they're, they're hunkered down, like they're on a nest here as well. But this one looks like it's standing and it's really close to this one. So I'm going to say that there's four nests, but okay. it looks like this is potentially both members of a pair. Um, so, sorry, they're, they're nesting, right? Yeah, they're nesting. They're on, I can I can see it looks like they're on nests, but I can't um I can't see what's on the in the nest. So I can't see what the nest contents is without going closer. And if I go closer, they'll flush. And I don't want to do that because in this case it's just a sensitive part of the breeding season. And so um we will record the the rest as NAs because we don't actually know what the nest contents is, although their behavior and the way they're sitting indicates that they are incubating or potentially on small chicks that I can't actually see. Okay. And obviously we will go around and look from the other side as well to confirm yeah. that. But we these two here, to me- Confirm the number of nests, sorry. 
So number of nests would be four, five yeah. individuals, and then these two look like they're okay. potentially from the same nest. How confident are you of your count? Um, I'd say I'm of my count, I'm high, it's high confidence. Okay. All right. So that's all the species here. Yeah, I don't see so anything else. Nothing nesting in the inside. You didn't see any um, birds flying around, like sweet terns or something mm -hmm. flying around. Nope. Okay. All right. So I'll put the end time. That was fast. You can see the real professionals. Mm -hmm. And also, would four so but but would four four forty four could be in the morning or in the afternoon? You're right. So I'll correct that. Thank you. Okay, great. So let's go um, to the another site. Um, so we have to go back on a boat or maybe just wade in the water, but we, we won't go much closer uh, because we don't want to disturb the birds too much and, and flush them all uh, because they will take a long time to come back. Um, this time of the year, they should not have small chicks, but <clears throat> if they are, the chicks could escape and, and fall in the water. Um, so I see that there are questions in the chat. Sorry. Oh, no, it's just many things. Sorry. Um, okay, so I'll pick another spreadsheet for this side for the frigate bird. So it's all filled up already. Um, same kind of people. This time we have something to measure this, the wind speed, so we put it there. Um, because there are a lot of them, and just because it will be faster right now for this example, we'll do, to do another subsample. And we'll, ju we'll just do one part of the colony. Uh, so it's another subsample. And this time it's just, um, we're just going to count half the colony. And it's okay. also partial coverage. Okay, so um... I can see juveniles and adults. Can you uh, wait? Well, can you tell me the habitat first? I guess it's. Mangrove. Oh, sorry. So, um, habitat is is red mangrove. Yeah. All so, our our G is the code we're using, and then so red mangrove, and then um, it's one hundred percent red mangrove because they're just on a mangrove bush over the water. So that's it for habitat. Um, it's magnificent frigate birds. Uh, yeah, what's the code for that? So that's M A F R. Yeah. Um, All right, go ahead. I'm going to start with the juveniles, which are the ones with the white heads, because they're going to be easiest to count okay. first to get out of the way. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six juveniles. That's yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and then adults. <clears throat> One. It's not very color. Not very bright color, though, is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's it? Yeah, I believe. Oh, nine. Little hidden one there. Yeah, maybe another one to the left of. Um, He's already in the middle. This one. Or, okay. So, sorry, how many adults did you say? The nine, I've counted. Nine. There's something on the side, but it's cut off. So, nine. Um, But I can see both males and females. So, okay. I'm going to clear. So, nine would be total number of individuals. And then if I can break it down into. Um, males and females, the males, I would say, is one, two, three. Okay. Um, from this distance, that's all I can count for sure for males. Yep. Oh, he's a male because he's got a bit of red, so that's four. And then females, let's mark it with another colour. Um, so four males, one, two. Three, four, five. Okay. Six. Six. And we don't know what this one here is because 
Now, actually, it looks to me like it's a female because of the size and the color of the plumage, but we don't know for sure. So six okay. females and one unknown. Okay, so we have uh, nine adults, four males, six females, and one unknown. So that's 11 birds. So we have either nine or 11. Ah, so we have a miscount. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Live. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. Kendon is helping. Seven, Kendon, James. Eight, nine, ten. All right. We, I guess we. We might we, run out of time. <laughs> we'll, see your, yeah. we'll see your second count is more precise because you actually counted by. Yeah, uh, by six. Um, but okay. I guess it shows it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. I'll write it down. Um, but hopefully, if we're in the field collecting data as well, we're going to be moving around and seeing yeah. them. So. Okay. Um, are they nesting? I think. So we've gone out in this. Is, this is pre-breeding season. Um, at this colony so we've gone out when they're not they're building they're starting to build nests so none of them there are no active nests at the moment they're engaging okay. in pre-breeding behavior and so all of these young are not zero year but they're, they're they're not from this year they'll be from well they'll be from this like last year essentially or, okay, or so older or older so i'll make a note that they're not nesting yet um And we should plan to come back a bit later, maybe in a month. Um, yeah, if we can. Okay, I guess we should have planned better this visit. Well, I think it's important as well to come to come out and see what's going on and to see the pre pre breeding because yeah. actually we don't know exactly when they're breeding as well, and and actually different populations breed at slightly different times. So um, it's really important to get an idea of when your birds return to the colony. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm, re I'm not recording zeros. Um, uh, because there may be nests that we're not seeing, but um, I'm putting NA that we're not counting nests because we think we're too early. What's our degree of your degree of confidence in your account? Well, the fact that I did it wrong twice <laughs> would say it's not high. <laughs> Let's give it a moderate. Okay. Um, but we would obviously go around and spend a bit more time if we had it, and if we're actually, I'd like to, I'd like to, to have lunch and do another count in half an hour. Uh, Francisco Contreras is asking, <clears throat> should the photos be attached to each form? No, you, you don't need to. It's more when you come back and you're, if you're not sure of your numbers, it might be easier to, to recount for, for yourself. Um, I'll go over that right now. Um, <clears throat> what we'll be asking is for the total numbers, not, not the spreadsheets here, which are more for the field. Yeah, so, so you may not actually have photos. You may just yeah. we're just doing a kind of exercise to pretend that we're in the field and um but it's always great to get photos because then you've got you've got your birds like you've got the data captured and it's a permanent record but you may not be able to if you're doing a flush count and you've got thousands of city turns flying over your head you're not going to be able to get photos right yeah so um sorry so come and asking to zoom in on the map so the map is you know a, a sketch um obviously this net well i guess this nest well i guess we use the map from another time so they, they are nesting on this map but they're not nesting nesting in a picture um but but just for the example it's good to write down what you're doing so here we split in two what's set what's sem sampled and what is not sampled and also wrote down where nests are obviously it can be a bit more difficult depending on on sites or if you have i don't know 500 turns nesting so you you will not write every nest uh, that's really up to you. It's for yourself. It's to help you as you're going to reproduce, remember what you did, um, what you should do. Like for the pelican, we say we needed to go around. So it may be good to write it on your map so you remember to go around. Um, yeah, it's just something to help yourself remember what's happening. <clears throat> okay. Uh, useful to show the compass direction. Yeah, it can be good to put the north. North start north arrow if you know it or any any direction that will help you here I think right and put it on on the left here are there any other questions about about that count or that 
spreadsheet. That's the what we call the um, the most simple uh, data sheet. Uh, it's not a transect, and not although we called it a plot, uh, we didn't record the GPS locations of every corner of the plot. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, reading Francisco's question. So if the registration site is known, a simple drawing could be made and it could be, yeah, detailed with satellite images like Google Earth. Yeah, that's true. Especially if you have the, the, the coordinates of the site, yes. And even sometimes if you have good pictures, um, you can see nests in the pictures, although they're not from this year, but it can, it can help you know where they're nesting especially for pelicans or, or frigate birds. All right, so, oh, it's already almost five. Um, okay, so we should stop this exercise and go back to the, um, to the PowerPoint. Um, can you remove your um, annotations, Rhiannon? The little uh, marks, thank you. So, okay, so we just went to the field and actually I wrote down in my notebook that made a sketch and as soon as possible try to enter the data into an electronic form this is so you remember everything that happened during the day uh, because in two weeks or in the months i may not remember what all those numbers mean in my little map i draw here so as soon as possible it's still fresh and if you can with your the people who are there with you uh try to enter the data in what we will call the database uh, we have the data sheets, which are more for recording, and then the database uh, for entering the data and storing the data. Uh, usually, there are different kind of databases. Of course, Excel is not per se a database, like actual database managers will tell you it is not, but um, something like Access would be. But Excel is good. It's easy to use. It's transferable. And it doesn't have to be Excel. Microsoft Excel can be Google, Google Sheet, for example. As long as it's a spreadsheet, it's transferable and easy to use. Uh, when you're, if you're creating your database from, from scratch from the beginning, think about what is relevant, uh, what you collected in the field and what you wanna keep uh, from that. Make sure um, it, the format is going to be useful for data processing. If you're going to actually process the data and use it for analysis later, um, you may need to know what kind of software you're going to use later, but it's good to keep things simple. Try not to use different kind of format. Like if you're putting a date, always put the date in the same format, this kind of thing. Also, it has, it's good if it's easy to use because you may not be doing this job. Um, you may you know, move to another job or your volunteers may change. So it's good if it's easy to use and straightforward to understand. Um, and longevity, that's about um, keeping it working, maintaining your database. Um, so ensure everybody knows how to use it. And, and actually things like um, Google spreadsheets, for example, is good because if somebody makes an error or deletes data, you can go back to a previous version, which is not true with Excel. One thing to remember um, is that if you're saving Excel files as a .csv format, which is what you're using in R or QGIS in other softwares, the .csv format may lose some formatting, especially with dates. So before you, you save it, um, make sure you're, uh, you have the good format, but that's only in special cases. If you're just saving it as a simple file, it's okay to save it as, as it is. So these are some examples of databases that, that we had um, laying around. The top one is from Rayanan. Uh, so she has the species. So th there is information on the date, the, the location, the habitat, the, um, the start, the size, waypoint, the people who were there. And then Rayanan keeps the species one after the other horizontally. Um, in my case, I keep the species vertically um, as just a preference. Um, and there's another uh, different types of database. They're really they're all about the same data usually: uh, site, location, date, number of individuals, and type of um, units you're counting. So what are we going to do? Is we're pro proposing uh, a standardized what we call the reporting database for the for the census. So we're going to share it together with the data sheets on, on the website, on the web page. 
um, it, it's going to have the same information as was in the data sheet example. And then you can enter it, um, enter each one of the other cells. In this case, you will have to do it every row or every line will be a different species or different location. Uh, we're trying to keep it simple. We will try to provide it in English, Spanish, and French. Um, and then yeah, hopefully it will be easier to for, for you to use. So it will be available on the, on the, on the website. You will be able to download it. Mm -hmm. um, I said not, it, it, it should not be adapted. It, of course, it can be adapted to your needs. Uh, but if you're going to send it back to us, it would be good to let us know where you're going to change and work together so it so it, the database is not very different. Of course, if you're already using a database because you've been doing this doing this for a long time and it's a different format, uh, but you want to share the data with the, with the working group with this effort, we should work together to find the best way to do that. Okay, that's one, just one uh, side note on data processing and transferring the count data into population estimates. So when we did the example, we just counted parts of colonies. We did not do a full count. If you do a full count and you count everything on the island, then you can just enter that into the reporting. That's your population estimate for this location. But if you do a subsampling like what we did, you just counted half of the colony, you have to extrapolate to know the entire population. Uh, there are a few steps to do that. I, will, I won't go into details now, but usually it's a matter of knowing what the area of the colony is, what the area you surveyed, and if it's the same habitat, uh, apply it, extrapolate it. If it's different habitat, then, then we have to go a bit more into details. Um, if you're interested in doing this and don't know how to do it, feel free to contact us. Um, there is also information in the Caribbean Seabird Monitoring Manual, which is available for free on the, on the web page. And that would be what's called level three sampling nesting colonies. So once you have discounts at the, the island, for the island or for the colony level, um, and you've entered it into your database, make sure you're, you're backing up, you're saving your, your data in your databases. There is nothing worse than losing data. Um, the first step could be to scan or to take photos of the, those paper data sheets and your notebooks, um, to store them in a safe location, not safe from robberies, but maybe safe from hurricanes or safe from fire. Um, save the electronic form into external hard drives. And what is best is to have one hard drive just for that, not all your family pictures and uh, just data. And also what is available to most of us is the online servers like Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever you're using or your organization is using. Um, but for extra safety, really try to store it in two different places. Um, if you have it on an external hard drive and there is a hurricane or your hard drive just falls on the ground and it, it won't work anymore, so you, you'll lose this, those data. But if you have it online, that's, uh, that's safer. Also online, you, maybe you lost your password or I don't know, something happened and you don't have access anymore, but you still have the external hard drives. So try to keep it at two location, that's the really best. Um, and now we'll talk about data sharing. I'll just check what time it is. Okay, it's fine, sorry. Um, so for this effort, what we really wanna be able to do is to have a, a picture of the, of the overall, or an overall picture of, of the whole region. And, and for that, we're asking if you're considered sharing the data. Um, I'll go into detail about what sharing means, uh, but <clears throat> we, what we do not want to do is just one of us, like Rhiannon or me or Anne or one of the working group chairs to have the data on their computer. Uh, we would like to put it into a data portal or a repository. And there are a few of them that are available. Um, something like eBird would be uh, used or OBC map, which is more about marine data or avian knowledge network, which is more about North America. The World Seabird Union has a global seabird colony register. Uh, and there is also GBIF. What well, we want to make sure that those platforms have um, can host seabird specific data type, like apparently occupied nest, 
for example, eBird or iNaturalist cannot use that. Uh, they can only have bird observation. So you can just say, I saw five adults. I cannot see, you cannot say I saw five adults and three nests. You can say three, for example, or three pairs. Um, the data has to be transferable. Uh, so for that, we need to use international standards, but also protect sensitive and confidential information about your sites, which may be protected or may be protected species. Um, what we're looking for is open access that the general public can see that the data are exist, but the partners, you retain your ownership. You're still the owner of those data. It's not the working group, it's you are the owner. And there is long-term database maintenance. For example, the, the World Seabird Global, sorry, yeah, Global Seabird Colony Register was a great effort, but they ran out of funding. And so it's not being maintained anymore, unfortunately. So for these, re so for these reasons, we, we have located GBIF, which is the Global Bio sorry, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, it's both a structure, uh, a network and a data infrastructure um, is really there to host data on biological um, entities, any type of data, and it's open to anybody. It's supported by countries, so it's the, the funding is from different countries in the world by international instances like the uh, United Nations, for example, and also some NGOs are funding it. So it's really international. Um, for example, it already has eBird data. eBird data is directly um, stored in a way into that platform or national database, like the French national wildlife database um, census is in there as well. The good thing of it is that the, um, the on is about the ownership control. You will re retain ownership control. It won't be the Cyber Group or Birds Caribbean that's owner it will be the in-country partners that's the, the good thing that you it won't yeah it, it will show that you have been collected in the data and it belongs to you and your country and your organization um, at the same time they're sharing specification you can decide i want everything to be available to anybody and they can download it whenever they want or i just want people to see that those data are available but they have to contact me uh, if they want to have them and then another good thing that there is a DOI, which is a digital object identifier. Uh, it's a code that would be like for a scientific article as a DOI, for example. So that just, it's a number that relates to your data set. So it's not just an Excel spreadsheet laying around somewhere. It actually have a, a, an actual number, which makes it official. So for the, the steps we we're proposing is that if you want to participate in this effort, then we really encourage you to do it. You, you, you design your survey, collect the data, put it into Excel. Then you can use the reporting spreadsheet database to enter the data in the database form at the, at the population, at the island level, once you have the total number of birds. Um, and you can send it to that email, Caribbean Seabird Surveys at gmail.com that we created. Together, we also uh, let you know the sharing specification that exists, of what I said, open to anybody or restricted or um, visible but restricted. And then we, the, the core, like the working group, me and Ryan, um, will work with GBIF to input the data into their database um, and then apply the sharing filters and, and the ownership information. And then what will be available eventually, it's a metadata, a summary of who is the owner, um, you, um, what type of data is available. I don't know, for example, brown pelicans, and then brown pelicans nesting pairs um, available. And then if you want people to download it, they can download it or contact you, contact information. So that's what we're proposing uh, right now for sharing data. And then I, I'm just looping back to, to what we were saying to the beginning. The, the idea is really with that platform and, and sharing, we want to be able to obtain that up-to-date overview of the seabird population in the Caribbean. As I was saying, we know not all these locations are going to be censused uh, this year or next year or maybe ever, but we really want to have as much as possible um, because it, it is needed. Uh, 
the Caribbean seabirds are not doing well, um, and there is information that, that's needed. At the national level, that's to inform management, um, inform species listing, inform development, for example. At the regional level, to update the maps, to share information within the region, but also within migratory pathways with colleagues in North America and South America or Central America, or maybe the other side of the Atlantic where the same species exist. Um, identify, identify goals, management goals, prioritize for new surveys in the future and coordinate action. One thing that is not listed here is that by trying to do a um, this kind of standardized survey all at once, um, it's also a proof of concept to show that it's possible to do it and, and we can do it. Um, I mean, we, like the whole region can do it. And that also to, sh to show funders in the future that it's possible to have this level of cooperation within the Caribbean, within so many different countries. Uh, I think that's something that's very important. Uh, sometimes funder, big funders, I mean, like I don't know, European Union or Fish, US Fish and Wildlife or the UN, uh, UNESCO, UNEP, don't think when they're too, they think when there are too many countries, it's not possible to have a, a good level of collaboration. And so that's one thing we want to, to test as well. So just finishing up and then we'll take some questions for those of you who are still there. So yeah, start using those data sheets in the field. We'll share them very soon. We're, we're a bit late, unfortunately. Um, once you start using them and looking over them, let us know if, if you think something is missing or something can be improved. Um, feel free to send emails at, at email, that email address. And then hopefully we'll see you on January 26th for a discussion about pelicans, frigate bird boobies, cormorants, all this bigger seabird and nest on shrubs and, and mangrove. Um, as I was saying in the beginning, we'll try to discuss with people who are doing surveys and those who want to do surveys, uh, discuss how they do it, what do you do when they're nesting on a cliff, um, these kind of questions. When is the best time to do it? In February, we'll talk about cavity nesters, so tropic bird shear waters and petrels a bit. And then in March, we'll talk about um, terns and laughing gulls, nodies, who are nesting in, in bigger colonies. So please do join us and thank you everyone. And then if there are a few questions, if you're still there, um, yeah, I'll answer a question. So there's a question from Francisco Contreras, Venezuela can participate. Yes, of course, uh, Venezuela should participate. There are a lot of Venezuelan islands uh, with seabirds. There's already um, Juan Carlos um, Fernando Ordonez and Jos Mar Marquez, Esteban Marquez, who are doing censuses. So if you have their information, it would be good to um, uh, to chat with them to see what they're going to work on. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat or just use your microphone. Feel free to do that too. Thank you. Hi, good day, Ivan. Uh, Ken Dunn here. I, I, um, I just wanted to verify. I know this is a seabird workshop and I have participated in the uh, monitoring, seabird monitoring with uh, EPIC. Uh, just point of note, I'm from Grenada. Um, I just want to also note or uh, clarify if there is possible for uh, same type of um, information for land birds, uh, specifically the Grenada dove, which is, as we know, critically endangered um, in terms of the nesting and uh, how do you go approach go about approaching the um, uh, Getting information on a critically endangered birds as as that as that point. I think Lisa, maybe you can answer that since you're there's the more yeah, sure. Um, yes, we have another whole program for land bird monitoring, including for targeted species that are threatened, like the Grenada dove or the whistling warbler or the St. Vincent parrot. So um, we are planning to do a workshop in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in St. Vincent the last week of January. Um, you could be invited to attend that workshop if this is something that you're interested in learning. It's We're targeting our workshop for St. Vincent Forestry, but we have um, spaces for a few others from you know, nearby Lesser Antilles Islands to come because this is a whole regional program to get land bird monitoring going in, in the Caribbean region with all of us using the same protocols so that we can more easily compare data and so forth. 
So can you send me um, an email and I will see if we could get you into the workshop if you're available? Sure, Lisa, that would be great because initially I started um, collecting data in the most discreet way possible using camera traps, but mm -hmm. I want to know um, the uh, appropriate um, sample method techniques so that um, data can be transcribable to persons who want to replicate such studies. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a fairly new land bird monitoring program. This is going to be our second workshop to train our partners. We did the first one in the, in the Dominican Republic, and this one is in St. Vincent. So it would be fantastic if you're available and can attend. Um, but at the very least, we can send um, share with you the, man the uh, monitoring protocol and, and some other data sheets and things like that. Sure, yes, that would be great. I most okay, send me an email and I'll send you the email. Yeah, send me an email and we'll see what we can do to, if you're available to get into the workshop. Okay, and just to verify, your email address is the one at the bottom of your screen. Uh, yeah, Lisa, Lisa Sorensen at Lisa, Lisa at dot Sorensen at Yes. Okay, perfect. Can. All right. Thanks again. Sure. <clears throat> and also a reminder that the Caribbean Water Bird Census is starting Saturday. Saturday. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, the 14th. Yeah. 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 It's not necessarily about nesting birds, right? But there will no. be seabirds in it. Uh, so it's a yeah. good way to go out and see where seabirds may be uh, located. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can go out and scope out, you know, seabird sites. We, it's to record all water birds. And yeah. course, we encourage people to record all birds seen on any of their counts because that makes the data much more valuable. So um, do visit our website to learn more about the Caribbean Waterbird Census. I hope many of you are participating. I'll put the links in the chat to the CWC and also our land bird monitoring program. But follow us on social media. We're providing lots of information about the, about the CWC and um, a special push this year to do our own Caribbean piping plover census to look for piping plovers. And they're on the rocky keys and the beaches and the sand flats and much of the same habitat as seabirds. So, so always good to look out for them because they're a threatened species. We have another question from Francisco. Um, when does the census start? It starts whenever you can go out. Um, uh, can the data be sent throughout the year? It can, but as much as you can, it would be better to send it all at once, uh, once you've had the chance to put it into as a population form, um, once you have more, more information on every site you're going to to survey any other questions Feel free to just. Speak. I just want to make a comment uh, very quickly because my kids just came back from school and they will be a bit noisy. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here. Just a, remember, a reminder that <clears throat> avian, sorry, avian influenza is uh, has been located in the Caribbean bird flu. It's been seen in uh, brown pelicans in Venezuela, with about I think about seventy or so brown pelicans dead from the disease. Um, if you're going out, make sure you report any dead animal or, or any suspicious things, um, large number of dead birds, the dead, dead seabirds. Do not touch them, uh, do not move them, but try to take pictures and then report to us. You can use that web, uh, that email address or try to look, well, the best is to contact your local um, veterinary or uh, health officials, but it's something to keep in mind. All right, I, I have to go. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And um, thanks, everyone. I'm leaving, but Rihanna and Lisa are, are still there. Yeah, see Jennifer's comment um, for seabird census. We recommend pre peak breeding for colonies for waterbird census. We recommend window opening now in all cases when you can. Can you comment more on that, Rhiannon? Should people try to go for peak breeding? Yeah, definitely. And that, that that varies with species, obviously. So we've got 
and and between populations but pelicans are are starting and or in in the midst of it at the moment and that's so we're trying to time the species hour discussions that we do to the kind of main periods that the the different species are breeding but ideally it's good to get to go out when when either they're incubating or they're still the adults are still quite attached to nests if they've got small chicks because obviously your counts are going to be um, your estimates are going to be off if you're if you're kind of later on in the breeding season and there's big chicks and they're moving around so you want to do it when they're still attached to a nest site as closely as possible but if you're just starting at a new site as well we know for species like brown boobies they can they can vary hugely in their the timings of their breeding between years and they can have multiple peaks so it can be a bit difficult to get that initial information on breeding timings but it's just getting out there to start the efforts and um but we'll provide you with more detailed information on what we expect for the different species based on knowledge throughout the region in the coming sessions. All right, thank you so much to everybody for participating um, in this webinar and we hope you will um, find opportunities to go out and survey your seabirds, your seabird colonies. Um, Do keep in touch with any questions that you have. And if you're not signed up for our newsletter, our monthly newsletter, be sure to sign up. I put the link in the chat because uh, we'll have we'll um, be announcing more news about the Seabird Census. You should also be signed up to our listserv, um, which I think Yvonne put that in the chat as well. Yeah, to stay up to date. We have a Seabird listserv on groups.io. Yeah, Yvonne did put that in the chat. So that will help you to stay up to date and follow us also on social media. We always post about things that are going on. We have a Caribbean Seabirds working or Caribbean Seabirds group on Facebook as well. Yes. So look for that and follow that. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and all. All right, last call for questions. And if not, we will sign off. And thanks again for participating. And we look forward to staying in touch about seabirds. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thanks, Rhiannon. Thanks, Yvonne. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye for now.